because it gives us the opportunity to contextualise the exhibits a bit more and show some of the sketches and some of the finished works alongside uh, the works in the exhibition and so on. Um, and to do it in more or less the order of the, that the exhibitions unfolded, because it started in Bury. So we'll start by journeying north to Northumberland, um, and then it, it went to Carlisle, so we'll have a trip over the Pennines to the Lake District, and then return to Yorkshire and finish up here in our own area. The title I should explain um, seems best to do it, The Labour and Love. It comes from Ruskin. Uh, Ruskin said, amongst many things about Turner, that his experience of Yorkshire specifically at first opened up the labour and the love of his life. And the argument of the exhibition is that his first visit to the North and to Yorkshire in 1797 uh, transformed him and opened the pathway to his future career. I'll be going backwards and forwards, I think. The following programmes must be closed before the installation can proceed. <laughs> Deferred, I think. That sounds like the best one. Right. Here's our map. Um, at about the time of this tour uh, in seven, the tour was in 1797. This was probably painted a year or two later. It was elected associate of the Royal Academy uh, in 1799. So it probably marks that occasion, a real milestone in his career. Uh, and achieved largely on the basis of the work that he produced as a result of this tour in 1797. He was, in 1797, he was 22 years of age, and really at the outset of his career, but he already had something of a reputation as an architectural draftsman. In fact, this waterfall, which is at the British Museum, and is an in the interior of uh, Westminster Abbey, was bought by Edward Lassels of Howard House for the princely sum of three guineas. <laughs> and within a very short period of time, um, Turner's price has escalated from watercolours of this size up to 10 guineas and then 15 guineas and then 50, 100. Between 18, it was an absolutely phenomenal success, between 1800 and 1810, so between age 25 and 35, he banked over 10,000 guineas. Um, and by the time that he died in 1851, his estate was valued at £165,000, which is an astronomical sum of money uh, in the mid-19th century. And more or less the you know, financial success of uh, modern artists such as uh, Picasso or someone like that. So there was no greater success, I think, in, uh, in our than Turner in this period. Um, our exhibition has a core of works that look like this, but this is a good introduction to uh, Scarborough. Um, Turner actually didn't visit Scarborough on the, the first tour of 1797. Uh, he concentrated on the central dares. Um, but he came back only three years later in 1801 and immediately rectified the deficiency. But there are, um, the majority anyway of our exhibits are of this kind. And they're what scholars during my career anyway are generally called colour beginnings. Um, right from the beginning, and this was probably painted about 1809 as the basis of the watercolour that's now in Australia. But right from the beginning in, in the tour of 1797, um, he made these large actual scale, the same scale as intended finished water, but very loosely. They're not as loose as they, they appear, but they're certainly the washes are, um, are liquid and, uh, and free. 
um, but he just knows exactly where even the finest detail is going. And when you compare it with finished works, you can see the suggestions even of very incidental details and things of, of that sort. But of course, his sketches and the majority of the sketches in our work and the sketchbooks that were exhibited, although not the actual exhibits that we've chosen, are pencil sketches. Line. Here's one of those sketchbooks. We'll see some of the contents of it as we go along. Um, but this is the, the larger of the two. Very luxurious leather bound thing. Imagine this when it's new with its brass clasps gleaming. I mean, this was work, you know, intended to be of some ambition which you could show to prospective patrons and they could choose finished pictures from it, and indeed they did in considerable numbers. But the work in them, the vast majority of the work in these sketchbooks, these are, as I said, line drawings in pencil. So the colour beginnings were, his, were the space in which he could work out what he was principally interested in, which were the phenomenal effects of nature. Um, that had been opened up to him, really, had, come, had become his principal <laughs> subject as a result of this tour. I'll just show you a map of the key points on this tour, um, just to get them. He started in Derbyshire, actually his sketches on the tour in Derbyshire, made his way to Leeds and to Kirkland Abbey, and then came north via Knaresborough, and where there's a lovely sketch of the castle uh, from downstream, and then northwards to Fountains and Ripon, and then to Richmond and north, further to Durham, and then to Tyne and Walkwood and up to Northumberland Coast. Before crossing to the Lake District, he spent a couple of weeks in the Lake District, you'll see some examples of that later, and then came back to Yorkshire um, to visit Harvard. He stayed in York, actually, sorry, initially stayed in York for a few days, made a lovely series of sketches uh, of the Minster and the town, um, and then was invited to go to Harvard. He'd been commissioned by Edward Lapis to make uh, a series of sketches of the house and the castle, um, and of Compton <coughs> Rocks. Um, we'll come to those in due course, um, but now we'll take, I'm just going to follow the order really of the subjects in the exhibition. So our first Northumberland subject is Tynemouth Priory. Um, Funny, it's a funny how the memory plays tricks on you because I'd rather imagined that we were looking over the entrance to the time, and indeed, time of Priory was built, as it were, overseeing the entrance and with a safe lantern guiding shipping into the time. But this isn't, as I misremembered a long time before this year, uh, as I was there, um, this isn't the cost of time, this is actually. Uh, a, a little harbour called Priors Haven, which uh, boats could come into um, and land fishing boats often fly from there. And that was his first Northumberland subject. This is the sketch in the, in the sketchbook and it gives you an idea of what he could do in watercolour already, just in a few, for half an hour or so, working directly. Um, and often they've got quite specific effects, although the colour's somewhat faded now. Um, but here we've got the, the sun slanting in from the east, so it's dawn, and indeed dawn is a, uh, a common <coughs> feature in these sketches of the she needs to have a VPN client. What's a VPN client? <laughs> Please refer to the email sent from ICT.
Let's carry on the gown. I don't want it to leak your head if it ever all sorts of having a bit of council secrets exposed. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, mind you, unless I do get rid of it, it won't, it won't advance. All right, fingers crossed. Fingers <laughs> crossed. Oh, no. Defer. Okay, we're back. So this is the, this is the, come on, come on. This, this is the, that's in the exhibition. This was probably a uh, studio for the colours. Um, made during the winter of 1797 to 8 afterwards. So, and it was, and did indeed, uh, paint uh, an oil, but it's un unfinished now in, I think, the museum. And you can see oil stains <laughs> actually on, uh, uh, on the sheet from uh, it being in English next to the with the studio. Um, but Turner already discovered um, in this tour uh, the, the drama of people uh, engaged vividly with nature and exposed the sort of the <laughs> elements in a way that uh, his own background had given him little inkling on. He was born in the middle of London in Maiden Lane, Covent Garden, um, about as far from these <laughs> exposure uh, to weather as you could get, I guess, in uh, a, a late 18th century society. Um, but he was his principal subject, in, apart from the phenomena of nature and the topography that he was exploring, was always the human dimension of that landscape, the people who made their living in these landscapes that he was visiting, and generally working people. And we'll see actually the effects of that in due course. And here is the finished watercolour of time at, at Pryor. The, one of the arguments about, and one of the uh, things that the show demonstrates, is that no tour really had such longevity, such a profound impact on his career. Um, he came back to subjects in those 1797 sketchbooks in pretty much every decade of his career thereafter, right up into the 1840s. This is a watercolour painted in the early 1830s of Time Now Project. Here we are actually looking, he's, he's, he's stepped back from the near view plot and he's looking across the entrance to the town here from uh, South Shields. And we're in cataclysmically <laughs> stormy conditions. The watercolour sadly was destroyed in a fire um, in 1964 when it was private collection. And so that is now the only record that we have of it. His next major port call was represented in the exhibition, but although not quite in the way that he sketched it, um, is Dunstan's Red Castle. In fact, if you have a look around the show here, there are quite a, a few um, contemporary depictions of Dunstan. But notice the rocky foreshore, um, because that's something that uh, his memory failed him with a little. Here's the pencil sketch in the, uh, in the sketchbook. Uh, and he came back to this several times in the um, immediate aftermath of the tour. But then again in the 1830s, about the same time as the, um, uh, the time of the that we've just seen. Uh, and this is in the Manchester City Art Gallery. It was lent to the um, Berwick exhibition, but of course watercolours are very susceptible to exposure to light. So the galleries that own them are, um, you know, bound by really strict conditions and protocols over the amount of exposure that they could have. So one of the things that we've done during the, uh, the peripatetic unfolding of um, the Northern Exposure is borrow things specifically of the locality of um, the various venues. 
Um, this is where the, 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 rock, the, the foreshore is all windsurf. Uh, uh, those of us, those who've been there will know of this walking up from Craftsford. But Turton has replaced that with a, a sandy shore here with the boat, um, driven ashore. And again, the human drama and the, the local law um, comes very much into play in this picture. Um, we've got a boat being driven ashore in the tempest storm overnight, um, and the local people have come down to salvage the cargo for taking it off. Um, they would probably prefer that the customs man <laughs> hadn't quite turned up just at that moment to superintend their activities, since quite a number of people supplemented their living on the North East Coast by salvage work and smuggling away probably. The following application is about to be installed. <laughs> 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 uh, this is the watercolour that we've um, that, that we've got in the exhibition. Um, a much later colour study. So the, the major phases of um, activity were that Turner made quite a number of works on the tour fairly immediately and established his early reputation. Then as a mature artist, he made a series of well over a hundred, but 96 were in red, of views of England and Wales. And of the first 50, um, about half of them are North of England subjects drawn from these two sketchbooks. And of course he made colour studies for um, all of them. And this is a return to Dunstanborough, but now with the sun behind the castle. I'm not sure, well, in fact I'm, I am sure, this is not strictly possible. Um, <laughs> but the sun in midsummer when he was there, he, he, uh, he travelled north in early July, um, does um, rise uh, over the sea, but not quite so normally uh, as Turner showed it here. But nevertheless, he appears to be recalling his own first impressions, riding up or walking up from Craster in the early morning, because almost every single one of his pictures of Dunstan shows the castle with dawn sunlight breaking upon it. It was said that Turner had seen more sunrises and sunsets than the rest of the Royal Academy should put, put together <laughs> <laughs> um, And he did, in, on his tours, he spent every hour of his working uh, day um, sketching and exploring his various subjects. So, and his favourite time was around this one. Yeah. And the next topic, the next subject is Dunstan, uh, the Bamber, in short. And this we have a really magnificent uh, colour study for. Here's the pencil sketch that he made. Probably, this is probably a, a collier, this is probably not a wreck or um, an emergency. <coughs> Yeah, with the bow on shore. Um, probably bringing coals to the, the town of uh, Bamber and being uploaded in a car from there. This was quite an orderly unloading because the boats were uh, driven up on the high tide onto the sand beach and then unloaded down <coughs> between the, the tides. But, but Dunsabrook, uh, Bamber became really quite a, a centre for. Um, uh, maritime rescue. I thought one of the first lifeboats in Britain was stationed there. Um, and Turner made a, a remarkable series of studies and a finished watercolour in the later 1830s. This is one of four full size colour studies that were made of, uh, of this composition in order to get the effects of storm and light, transient gleams of sun, sunlight, um, correct. And there's a 
really interesting context mm -hmm. in which this, the Finnish wardrobe was exhibited. I can show you a slide of the wardrobe. Sadly, the, the wardrobe it was, it was sold at uh, Sullivan a few years ago for an astronomical sum, something like three million pounds. But um, it went to an American private collection <laughs> and was not available for any of them in uh, here. But this was described uh, shortly after it had been painted as possibly the finest watercolour in the world. Certainly it's a two and a fourth, it's not quite the size it is on that screen, but it's one of his largest watercolors of the same size as the study, with all sorts of um, dramatic um, salvage and uh, life-saving going on in the, in, in the foreground. The context of Howard in which it was exhibited is, um, is quite remarkable. Um, it was first exhibited not at the Royal Academy or at the Watercolour Society or indeed any of the established art venues. It was, it, it was exhibited at an occasion, a meeting of a, a society about which people, uh, nothing seems to be known, it really wants researching, called the Graphic Society. It was an informal meeting of scientific, artistic, literate, engineers, um, figures of at the cutting edge of both science and the arts. Um, at the exit, at the, at the, uh, the meeting at which Turner exhibited this, um, Charles Babbage demonstrated a counting machine <laughs> um, and Henry Fox Talbot showed some drawings with light. How cutting edge is that? And this was a time in which scientific thinkers and artists could talk to one another on almost equal terms and in fact were engaged, felt that they were engaged in the same pursuit. Turner's business was the accurate understanding of the phenomena of nature. And although he might not have had the scientific apparatus and framework to describe the effects that he was depicting, um, his observation was acute and it was informed by conversation and knowledge wherever it was gleaning. And no one, even the scientists would have admitted, ever understood the range of effects and how they were mechanical uh, in nature than Turner. So that takes us to the most notable point of our tour, which is Norham Castle on the River Tweed on the Scottish border. Norham's on the English side, um, but the little house on the left there is on the Scottish side of the Tweed. Um, we have two um, waterfalls of Norham. Turner himself visited Norham in 1797 and and return to that, the viewpoint of that sketch, um, pretty much in every decade of his life, culminating in a magnificent oil painting that we'll see a slide of in just a minute. Um, but he himself <laughs> recorded that, or testified, that this was one of the most important of all of his subjects. In 1831, he was he visited Sir Walter Scott at Abbotsford and been commissioned to make a series of illustrations for Scott's lifetime work. And was travelling on from Abbotsford to Bury on Tweed and then north to Edinburgh. And he was turning to going off <coughs> on a tour of the Highlands uh, and the Western Isles in search of Scott subjects. Um, but as he, he was travelling with with Scott's publisher, Robert Fidel. And as the coach passed to Norham on the way between Abbotsford and uh, um, Bury, Turner stood up in with the coach and made a low bow to the ruins. And Cadell, and Turner had a bit of a reputation of being strange by this time. Um, 
to, to, to them a while, apparently, to pluck up uh, <laughs> courage to ask her what it was about. But he said, then, in 1797, I came here and made a sketch, and from that day on, I've had more commissions than I can execute. So he himself dated the origins of the success to um, that tour and specifically to um, the north uh, and its turning point at Norham. We have this wonderful full beginning again, um, this series of watercolours that Turner made for engraving this hundred watercolours. Um, presumably was intended on the evidence of this to, um, to include a subject of norm, but in the effect, in, in, the, in the event it didn't. Uh, and this was as far as the subject progressed on that occasion. Um, I should say that there are tens of thousands of works in the term request. It left the entire content of his story. It's a complicated story, but the, the, the entire content of the studio came to the nation and are now the take gallery in London. And there are literally thousands and thousands of colour studies. This was identified as known last year when we were actually working on the show, so I did the absolute most to include it because it was fresh off the scholarly <laughs> angle. Um, but not by me, uh, by a whole host of people who are currently working to recatalogue all that material. Um, and it's gradually all coming on stream online. If you go on the Tate's website, uh, you can explore pretty much everything in the term request, at least visually. And most of it now, certainly two thirds of it, has quite detailed cataloguing and commentary associated with him. But this is his final statement on the matter of Norman. This is uh, probably from the last five years of his life, from the mid-1840s, when he went back over a number of subjects that he'd uh, uh, developed in, in the first couple of decades of his career, uh, and reworked them in inimitable uh, style. Um, by this time, and by this time, actually, his reputation, his public popularity, anyway, had begun to fade. I don't think anybody doubted the content, um, but the, the, the taste in art was for much more highly finished and detailed um, subjects. And pre raphaelites were about to um, become the main thing. Um, in British art. Um, and Turner, Turner's ethereal, poetic, sublime uh, treatments of nature had become old fashioned, or at least not to the direct, um, crisp, um, defined taste of the, uh, the British public. As one critic, uh, not me, sadly, put it beautifully, Turner was by this time a poet, a, a drift on a sea of prose. <laughs> <laughs> so that takes us to the, the latest, I thought you were doing it okay. And then I'll move on quite quickly to Keswick and to uh, the view of uh, Derwent Water looking south uh, into the jaws of Borrowdale. Um, the weather, we know a good deal about it, went through the papers for the weather reports for uh, July and August in 1797. It turns out that it was pretty mixed, but generally good in July when it was in Yorkshire and Northumberland. But it got to um, the late district at the beginning of August and it was unremittingly wet <laughs> for the next three weeks. Now there's a familiar experience, <laughs> and no doubt. Um, and when you look through the sketches in the sketchbook, you realise that he didn't see, on this occasion, didn't see a single mountain top, clearly. <laughs> um, this is the sketch um, in the sketchbook that we're, we've opened it up of that very view. You can see how wet it was being. It's now conspicuous 
the dog falls, it's in the, in the distance. And here's the, uh, the large, one of three, in fact, that we have in the exhibition, the large colour silver one um, uh, of Keswick Lake. And that, uh, he, made, he did make a finished watercolour of this and indeed presented it to uh, a fellow Royal Academician, Joseph Barrington, but sadly it's so um, proof that watercolours need uh, careful conservation. It's been hung in strong sunlight for most of its uh, life and is now just a brown shadow. Um, but you can imagine what the, how rich and um, sublime it must have been um, from this study. He came back on the tour that um, he visited Scarborough in 1801. He was actually heading to Scotland uh, to explore the Highlands, but on his way back he called in again at uh, Keswick and made this. Now this was probably painted, although the, the first one we've just seen wasn't. It's almost a, that was a, this was probably painted direct from nature because there is no sketch of uh, the, the subject from 17, from 1801. Um, and by this time, it was you know, one of the best trained watercolorists uh, in, um, in the history of the Indian. Um, there's probably nothing in this that he couldn't achieve in three hours or so of work. The, the most problematic thing for him would have been waiting for underwashings to dry so, so that he could work on top of them. But of course he was so practiced as a watercolorist, he didn't really need to worry over much about that um, since he could organize his palette and his procedure on the, on the sheet so effectively and so well practiced uh, man. And this is the third treatment of that same view. Again, only identified within the last couple of years as the new work on the, on the subject in the turn of his western focus. But of the same view. But from that tour of 1831, when he was in search of subjects for Sir Walter Scott, he was travelling on his way north, uh, in this case. Um, to, to visit Scott at Abbotsford, but called him again on really rather well, settled condition. I just wanted to show you this, this is not in the exhibition, but this is a good example of the destination of those watercolours that he was making for the England Wales series, because they were meant that they were designed to be engraved by the very <coughs> finest uh, etchers and engravers in the country on copper um, and, were, and are in many ways representative of one of the peaks of Turner's career but they, they always have wonderful detail. In this case, um, when Turner was, Turner was famous, and probably one of the most famous artists in Europe and um, had done work for quite a number of poets, Samuel Rogers, Scott Byron, all the leading literary figures of the day. And almost certainly stayed while he was in Keswick in 1831 with Robert Sully, who was then poet laureate and who lived in Keswick. Sully had a bit of a reputation for, as a Lake District poet, for not much liking to go out in inclement conditions. <laughs> um, and I rather, <laughs> it, it would be typical of him, although it's Pure speculation, I admit. Um, and I would rather like this to be his recollection of something <laughs> coming out of a rowing boat expedition on the lake, um, having been caught, if we just flip back, um, clearly in a shower uh, on the water. Um, certainly, Turner was enjoyed sending the unaware uh, for a wetting and we'll see an example of that actually from very near the beginning of his career uh, very shortly but I just thought now we've got back to you turn to uh, Yorkshire via Lancaster uh, Skipton and Settle 
Bob Mabby had a quick visit to uh, before taking his station in York to await his summons to Harwood. And he made a series of six watercolours, all now reunited after Hampstead, because they're again very rarely or only very occasionally for every four or five years brought out and put on exhibition because that's really all they can stand. But this is one of them, and I thought I would show you this illustration. Uh, an example, but again, showing this is, we know this was painted in November 1797 because Edward Lassie's account book survived uh, and he paid uh, 10 guineas for it. It's on the 27th of November, I think, in, uh, in that year. Um, and for one reason or another, we can discern from this and all that group. But I'm really taken with figures, and Turner was always interested in, as I said, in the working people, and it's the people who worked on that other estate who populate his work in this series of watercolours. We don't see actually anything of the, uh, the owners or their friends. Um, when the watercolours are not on show at Howard, you can nevertheless always see Turner at the house because his first two commissioned landscapes in oils of Plumps and Rocks hang in the saloon. And they were made specifically for those locations. There were formerly um, two doors opposite one another in, in the saloon, and it was decided to block them up. Uh, and Edward Lassie's commissioned um, two paintings for them because it, it was his father, the, the first servant. Uh, two uh, paintings to fill the, the gap. And the paintings, uh, the, the windows are in this shot to our right. The paintings themselves echo the direction of light that falls on them from the window. Now, I'll just show you one of them in a little more detail. Um, in the photograph of Plumpy Rocks, as it is today, as it was in. 1993, <laughs> when I took that photograph. But here's a painting uh, of that subject. And the time, the, 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 they're opposite times of day. Um, so the first one is the morning, and this is evening. Um, and the, the, the angles of light are very carefully calculated to reflect those days. So here we are at the end of the day, but we can see that while well, it was generally fine in the morning, now from the west, um, that dark clouds are building up behind the rocks. The working people on the estate uh, have seen this coming. They are men of nature. Um, they've pulled their boat out of the water, uh, they're tipping it up and sewing it for the night. Mind you, a party of, no doubt, the oldest friends, <laughs> not people of nature quite, are about to embark on a rowing <coughs> expedition on the lake. We can be quite sure that Turner's subversively sending them out for a dowsing in, in, in the rain that's about to advance in the pond. Well, that brings us to the room uh, of Yorkshire subjects in our exhibition. Uh, and these are love, it's a, a small selection. They are beautifully focused, I think, and hang together very well. So there's one of the subjects is of St. Agatha's Abbey, which is about a mile downstream of Richmond. And here's a pencil sketch that he made of it. He made two large walkers that came back to it in about 1820 to make this colour study. Um, and I've always been, but right from when I worked on these as a student um, back in the 70s, um, I was taken by uh, this as a, as a subject in particular. I was really interested in what's happening here. You can see a diagonal line of shadow 
and presumably cast by trees. This is just a hint of them uh, on the other side of the Banco River uh, opposite. But the sun is shining pretty full on this face of, of, uh, um, of the ruins. But that wall would be in quite even shade. It's the fact that there's light in the air um, that makes the top diagonal of that wall seem lighter. Um, hum hum humid air full of moisture particles reflecting the light um, towards the, um, the eye. Um, and this is in full shape <laughs> uh, cast by those trees. And Turner retained that effect throughout the finished watercolours. So here's the finished watercolours from the British Museum. Um, and uh, with that effect in, but, but also there's a human dimension. We've got a, here's the engraving which is exhibited in the caves. I, I particularly like the milkmaid who's finished her work in the evening and is sitting enjoying the uh, the evening sun um, while it lasts uh, on a little bench uh, in the shelter of the wall there. There's a lovely detail in this as well, which I'm by no means the first to observe, but um, worth pointing out to you. There's a little duck on the, on the wing, and for a period, and occasionally, uh, throughout the rest of his career. He, uh, he, he used this as a signature. His full array of uh, given names was Joseph Mallard William Turner. And the Mallard was often misspelt as Mallard. And even on this tour, the, the weather was actually quite good. He revisited the in 1816, and the weather was fairly unremittingly wet in Yorkshire in that year, the result of a volcanic eruption in the South Sea of Mount Tambor. It was known for years as either summer. Uh, and he said when he got to Richmond uh, that he would be wet footed uh, like a drake and continue in that vein. And the details are almost certainly uh, a poem on his own name. Uh, as well as uh, uh, a vehicle of his relentlessly locomotive uh, nature. And we're also exhibiting this wonderful uh, colour study of Richmond from the, uh, from the moors, looking east uh, over the town towards the Hamilton Hills in the, in the distance there. And that's the subject of uh, an engraving which we also exhibited, just to show you the, um, the miraculous detail uh, of weather effects that he was working out, these slanting curtains of rain passing over the, uh, the plain there in the distance. But also to show you the uh, the, the figures in the foreground. Turner had a, could, could sometimes be, you know, introduce figures merely to destroy them in storms and avalanches and so on. Um, but he was also aware of uh, the world at its most peaceful and enjoyable. And was at this time of making this, uh, this watercolour, um, building a house in, I mean, two of them, didn't it? Making, building a house in Richmond, in Surrey. And there was quite a spat going on in the press uh, about the song Sweet Lass of Richmond Hill, um, which actually still trundles along, rears its head from time to time. But I, I think Turner was certainly weighing in um, on the side of Richmond, Yorkshire is the rightful home of the sweet lass in these watercolours because she appears not always doing such playful things with her dog um, as exploring whether the latest style of millinery 
really suited him. Oh, no. But she appears in every one of the four finished ones that were, were turned made of Richmond. And here's uh, perhaps the finest, which we uh, were fortunate enough to be able to show in the exhibition. And there she is again, going off the milk of cows uh, in the distance there. You can see Lady Stool under her arm and two scampering dogs in attendance. That's my last slide. I mean, I, I, I probably ought to say, um, by the way, finishing, trying to give some perspective. So the tour opened up the life, uh, the, the labour and the love of Turner's life. Our argument is that he set off from London as an architectural draftsman and returned a great poet of uh, landscape sublime. And, set, and, and underneath that, there's, there's always Turner's interest in the human dimension of his landscape. Many of these are not quite, but they're early depictions of these sites, and they certainly shaped, I think, consciousness of these sites and of the landscape right down to the contemporary generation. And the effect, really, in the consciousness of contemporary artists is very readily evident, I think, in this wider exhibition around us. And I think that's Turner's real legacy. If I were to try and put it in a nutshell, it was really about, and probably what he conveyed more than anything else and taught, I think, to a generation, and indeed to generations um, that, that, that followed him. Not only what the phenomena of nature truly looked like, but also through northern experience and northern exposure, what it really felt like to be out and amongst it, and how good and a reminder of the vitalness of life that experience could be. Thank you. Excluded Barnley from the scope of this exhibition to concentrate on the 1797 tour. To have brought Barnley into it would have made it a potentially unwieldy large. Perhaps that is, though, an exhibition for the future. But I can certainly give you some context for that. He turned and met Bosley Fox, probably in London, um, in about 1800 or 18. Oh, two. Fox had a real interest. Turner, in 1802, Turner made his first tour to the continent, uh, to the Alps, um, just about going to northern Italy, but didn't, uh, didn't explore mainland Italy until um, 1819, some years later. But Fox commissioned a whole series of watercolours of Alpine subjects, mostly around Chamonix and Mont Blanc. Uh, and from that became really very close to a turn indeed, and probably Turner's closest patron. Um, it's said that Turner was truly at home amongst the family at, uh, at Farnley. Um, he was certainly treated as a member of the family, and the, a room was kept permanently available for his use. And from 1808, onwards to Walter Fox's death in 1825, um, Turner visited pretty much annually for there's only two or three years um, when he doesn't seem to have been at Farmer. Um, but that probably means nothing actually. He, he could easily have gone to Farmer uh, for the shooting and the fishing. And indeed there are lots of shooting and fishing subjects. I should just say, apparently Turner had a an umbrella that converted into a fishing rod. <laughs> Don't ask me how, but it would have been extremely useful on his 
stewards to uh, Yorkshire. Um, but it's said that, uh, and Ruskin also said, back from the Labour and the Love of His Life, um, that Turner was um, truly at home in, in, at, at Farnley um, and never forgot it. So the effect of Farnley, even after Fawcett's death, um, casts a, a light, an affectionate light, on all of his subsequent work. So, yeah, it's an important dimension of, of, of Turner's career. Uh, thank you for mentioning it, but uh, and apologies for having <laughs> enlightened it completely from, uh, <laughs> uh, from this exhibition. But yeah, it, 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 it's an exhibition to come, hopefully. Well, we've very much enjoyed your talk, and you've kindly agreed to do a second one. <laughs> 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 Down now. <laughs> <laughs> On the subject of Southern and the bad weather, I thought you might like to know that when Southern came to home, you said the air was delicious. Delicious. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you so much. <laughs>